Good to go. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining today's Tech Talk with the Tech Academy. Today, we have Phil Scott, and he's going to talk about technical debt. So thanks for being here and take it away. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Phil Scott. Uh, I've worked as a software engineer on a multitude of products uh, over about the last 15 years um, overall, but I've managed engineering groups uh, for about the last eight. Um, just for a little bit of context about what I do, I currently work as a senior software engineer and technical lead at Gap Inc., um, like the, the big clothing brand. Um, I work on teams that are uh, core teams. So basically everything that my team builds has to work for every branch of Gap and every brand of Gap worldwide. Um, so we run into some interesting challenges having to support all of these different business cases. Um, but in that, as one might imagine, comes a lot of technical debt uh, trade-offs, right? When we have deadlines to hit or features or something like that. Um, so that's a little bit of my credentials around how I've been dealing with technical debt uh, for a while um, and what we're going to take a look at. Uh, one thing I do want to preface this whole thing with is there is a ton of ways to deal with technical debt and to quantify technical debt as a whole. Uh, and we'll define technical debt a little more um, here in a minute. But this is a method that I use that I've put together um, just over my experience as being an engineering manager um, or tech lead or just on a team in general when we have to deal with this type of thing. Um, so this is not the silver bullet. Always go read more about it. Um, this is the cohesive process that I've just kind of put together for uh, general needs I see in engineering. Um, but it's definitely not a silver bullet for everything um, as really no solution is because it's very team specific. Um, but it, this can be a very useful tool to get you started um, and then you can kind of modify it to do what you want with it. I know it's a mouthful, um, but I gotta preface that because there's a million ways to deal with this. Uh, what we'll be covering today, uh, obviously about technical debt. Um, before we can really talk about it, we need to define it. Um, you know, what is technical debt? Uh, and at least the definition that I use for technical debt, which could very well be uh, different from others, depending on where you are, uh, how far removed you are from things like the code base or the infrastructure. Um, and then we'll identify the different types of technical debt. Um, we know we hear technical debt a lot um, when you are in like an engineering role. However, it can take a lot of different forms, um, and all of those different forms have uh, very specific and unique things that have to occur or areas that they belong to um, that dictate the complexity of how we how we address these problems. Uh, then we get into how do we manage the debt, right? So we identify different our different types of debt, the different um, kind of ways they fit together. Um, and then with that, we can start to give these technical debt items an overall quantifying for cost value, um, you know, doing something now versus putting it off and doing it later. Uh, and then if we can get to it, uh, we'll talk about adjusting for complexity in these different areas with waiting. Um, so uh, let's get started, I suppose. So what is technical debt? Um, this is the definition that I've kind of uh, stuck with over the last six or seven years um, when I really had to start diving into this when I started leading teams. Um, technical debt is the result of prioritizing a, a diluted product release or lesser feature quantity over quality and or long-term operation, um, which is really just a fancy way to say they would like it now, but with potentially less things or potentially more issues or hazards attached to it. Um, and this could be a ton of different things. Right, this could be database maintenance, this could be we need new infrastructure, um, this could be business process related. Um, but ultimately what happens um, really often with software shops, and it's one of the big hurdles for like startups, is not letting your technical debt kill you and end up in this iceberg situation. Um, so what technical debt causes is the application, which is like one third of the iceberg here, 
this is what gets seen, right? This is arguably the part that provides value uh, to the business or wh whoever you're making this piece of software for. Um, however, everything underneath that is what keeps it afloat. Um, or if it gets too big, drags the entire thing down. So the goal is to not end up in an iceberg situation. We can see here the top one third is the application. That's what gets seen. But then two thirds of you know managing this iceberg is a bunch of manual processes or old code, you know outdated stuff. Um, again, clutter DBs stuff like that. All of those things are different types of technical debt. And what, if they get too big, the bottom starts to get uh, too much, and the whole thing sinks. Um, startups run into this a lot because they'll put off certain things to get something out the door quickly. Uh, as deadlines are generally like more important um, for those early stages. So let's take a look at the technical debt categories. Um, and these are the categories that I always start with. Um, these categories, you can end up with more or less of these categories. It just depends on your needs. Um, but everything we're going to look at today is predicated off the number of categories that we're looking at the types of debt that we can see show up. Um, these don't have to happen in any particular uh, like linear fashion. So you won't go from logical debt to persistence debt, you know, to infrastructure. These can be combined in different ways. Um, this is just the easiest way for me to kind of show these different uh, categories. So the first is logical debt. Um, this is code debt. So this is like raw business logic. Um, so, you know, API reaches out to customers one integration, but now we want it to reach out to customer two. Um, but there's complications with that, right? We have to rewrite the logical code to go do that. Um, and how much of that work is there depend, uh, will dictate whether it becomes tech debt or not, right? So if you say, well, we're not going to do. We're not going to move to that uh, API structure because of something else. Um, you're recurring tech debt because, like, contracts change. The API might be different. These are all risks that can potentially be debt that have to be dealt with. Next is persistence debt. Um, this kind of falls under maintenance to a degree, and a lot of the time. So databases, caches, which are really just fast databases for the most part, and message brokers. Anything that has to do with uh, storage temporarily or permanently. Um, this shows up mostly as like database maintenance tasks like indexes, right? You have three searches in your application. You only, uh, for MVP, like minimal viable product, you only need one of those searches to be fast. So you uh, only index one table thoroughly. Um, and you don't for the other two tables. So now you have debt um, that you're going to have to go back and address right after the launch to go add these indexes to these other tables. Uh, persistence debt. Uh, um, infrastructure debt. So this is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger uh, as the years go on and we enter like the cloud space, um, you know, Google Cloud, Azure, AWS, things like that. Um, where we have to manage a lot more of our infrastructure and a traditional operations model. Is it something you find? Um, you know, we all hear the term DevOps uh, a lot, which can mean uh, a lot of things to a lot of people. But as that mentality continues to grow, we have infrastructure debt. Um, and this could be anything from we need to set up a new subnet. Uh, this could be we need to update our VM versions. Um, we don't know like if our software runs on the new versions. Um, or this could be we need to move firewall technologies. It could be anything to do with uh, you know like networking or your infrastructure in general. Things that you can get away with not updating for a while, but eventually will have to. Feature debt. Uh, so this is tied to the business, really. Um, so most uh, in most situations, you're attempting to produce a product um, for some business because they sell they sell that product or they sell a service um, around that product, things like that. Um, and we get requirements from the business for what the software should have to do. Um, but sometimes they want 
to cut features uh, to get something out faster, right? But they still want those features. That's feature debt or product debt. Um, so the engineers didn't, it has nothing to do with the technical side necessarily, but the business has said, we're going to scrap this right now to get something out faster, but we still have to come back and address this feature or this bug or whatever it is they, they got put off. Um, so that's feature debt. Third-party debt. Uh, third-party debt comes into play whenever you integrate with like a, well, a third party, right? You're, you're consuming another company's API or another team's API. Um, and let's say they release version two of that API. You don't have any control over the changes that occur in that API. So the contract changes that will occur there are kind of forced upon you. Um, and these are changes that come from third parties because we, you, don't, you don't have any control over you know, the Google's APIs. You know, if they make a breaking change, then that's the breaking change. And we got to go change what we did. Um, so different types of debt. Uh, I try to always stick to four or five categories because we're going to look at a little math based on the number of categories in a bit. So we, we've discussed like the different types of debt um, to look at, but like where do these really belong inside of an organization or like an engineering organization? Um, and this is the, the sectioning that I see occur more often than not. Um, and I would say this is a reasonably modern DevOps shop, right? Where you're not just an engineer, you need to know a little bit about the cloud, you're managing some of these configs, things like that. So we can see that like code and dependencies uh, belong to developers uh, for, because generally we're the ones writing the business logic, right? Um, we're the ones in the repos all the time. Uh, but we also own half of the persistence debt. And this is because the developers often dictate what data is available and stored inside of the database. So they are still partially responsible for what goes in there um, because it's the app, their application that's putting information into it. Uh, the second part is operations, which also owns half of the data, um, the persistence debt, right? Uh, because databases and everything still require infrastructure. So let's say you need to update your database version that is still persistence debt that will have to get done, but not necessarily uh, tied to like what data is being stored or how that data is indexed, which is more uh, what the developer would be worried about. Um, feature debt. Uh, that belongs to product or business. Um, so in most situations, uh, if you're working as a, you know, an engineer on like an API or something like that, you have a product person. This is your, rep uh, your representative to the business, basically. So the business says, this is something we want to do. Um, that initiative is normally given to your product uh, individual and they break it down into functional requirements, right? We need, I want to click this button and I want this thing to happen. Um, and then they bring it to, to the engineers, but they dictate the features that we build um, and how robust those features are. So feature debt is owned by product. Uh, third party debt can be owned by any of these because third parties can change things in integrations or processes or you know whatever it is uh, that we have to interface with with a third party. So like an external business. Um, you know, like Slack, for instance, um, is a, a service that most businesses consume uh, or integrate with. Uh, Third-party debt can go to any any of those uh, groups uh, because it, you know we don't know what their changes are for the most part, and you know we don't really get a say in the changes that they make. Um, to show a more uh, arguably modern structure for an engineering team. Um, for most DevOps teams, right, the developer and operations, um, or every engineer is both a developer and an operations individual. This is kind of what this graph looks like. Um, but I think the separation of the development and the operations model is important when considering the persistence layer. Uh, that is a lot of information. Uh, and I know I'm going fast because we burned a little bit of time. Um, but I went to... Uh, stop for a moment and ask if there are uh, questions about kind of what we just covered around categories. 
And attendees are welcome to uh, put their questions in chat. If uh, I do have the micro the microphones muted at the moment, if someone wants to ask a question, just go ahead and raise your hand and I'll unmute the mic. Yeah, it looks like we, we don't have any questions as of right now. Okay, moving on. So uh, we're gonna look at a little bit of math here real quick. Um, so we're gonna start looking, this is the first step to kind of quantifying our technical debt in a way that's at least useful information wise to us. Um, so technical debt weight cap. Um, so this really is just the number of categories times itself, because we're gonna start taking a look at how these intersect in like a Venn diagram style. And this essentially means it's the number of categories times the maximum number of intersections that can occur between all of these categories. Uh, it sounds complex, but it's way easier than it sounds, I promise. Um, but for the purposes here, right, we would know that our technical debt category uh, would be 25, right, because we have five different uh, technical debt categories. Um, but keep in mind that it's just um, number of categories times number of categories for now. So like I was just talking about, these different types of technical debt issues aren't as clear cut sometimes as they always seem. Sometimes these changes require more than just one area of expertise, right? So let's say um, there's third party debt. Uh, they've changed a product that you integrate with, which means there's code changes, but there's features that are no longer supported by the third party. So now it's also involving product, right? Um, feature debt. Because we have to not just update the code, we have to update how the features work or how many are there or something like that, right? So now this, uh, this tech debt that we're looking at uh, covers two different types of tech debt. So how do we address that? How do we type, kind of quantify that? Um, so for example, we have logical or code tech debt here and third party. Um, these two often overlap all the time, especially in like the API world. But let's say, like the scenario I was just talking about, this third party change also uh, removes something that a feature or something like that that, that we support or provide. Um, so we have to change how this feature works. Um, this is what our intersection looks like, our VIN intersection for this tech debt uh, looks like. So, and there's these different intersection points that we can see here where uh, only two of them overlap, um, but the one we're really interested in is the center one, right? So that is our maximum number uh, of intersections between our, our VIN here. So this, these, this intersection and this Venn diagram allow us to kind of give a rough value to this technical debt item. Um, so our maximum debt weight is 25. Um, to calculate our, the actual weight of a technical debt issue that comes in, we can take the number of categories uh, and the uh, highest intersection count here uh, and that gives us our technical debt weight for this problem, right? Which in this case is just three times three, um, nine. So this change that we would be looking at would have a total uh, uh, complexity weight of nine out of 25, right? Um, and this is our scale for identifying, uh, or at least to ide identify with the, the complexity of a technical debt item, because the more, um, overlapping technical debt categories there are, the more complex this item is going to be to fix or implement or come back to. Um, and again, this is to all this is just to give us uh, a general sense of what doing uh, or taking on technical debt would look like for like a developer task or not putting a feature out, something like that. Um, so, Nine out of 25 uh, is not bad. The, arguably, that's not a super complex technical debt item. Um, but obviously, all five categories would have to be involved for us to hit our maximum complexity levels uh, for this tech debt item. 
So how does that really help us in knowing whether we should or should not take on a technical debt item or make a decision that incurs technical debt? Um, so we're going to use an example that I run into all the time uh, where I work because we uh, integrate with a ton of third-party libraries and APIs and things like that. So let's say we have two weeks to complete a project, but we need to remove a third-party integration um, during this time, but we think it's going to take a week longer to do that than we thought. Uh, and we, we give business uh, two options, essentially. We can give us the extra week and we can remove you know that integration now uh, which is the left here uh, or on the right we can wait get it done in two weeks uh hopefully without any problems right and then remove that third party item later so the, what we're looking at right here is the current complexity model for any work that would have to be done within the system if either of these paths were taken. So, and that's to mean like, let's say this logic here on the left uh, that we're talking about, let's say we have to go update this logic again after we uh, this task uh, is done, right? If none of that third party code or logic is there, obviously that's going to be easier to traverse and modify um, inside of the system because all of the third party integration logic or you know, any, you know, any of that stuff is gone. Um, we don't need to deal with it anymore. Obviously, if we remove it later, we're dealing with an active feature set. So we've made changes, we've put a put a release out, but we've built it around a bunch of old code that we haven't removed. So that now means any task that involves this logic, if we don't, now has a complexity score uh, of five higher than if we removed it when we first found it. So Really, all this is to say, if you just do it when you find it, you're removing the need to deal with it in every other subsequent change that will happen between now uh, and you finally getting to this technical debt item. Uh, and I'm going to stop there because I know uh, it's it gets a little wild. Uh, any questions around how we compare uh, like working a task between keeping technical debt? and just dealing with it as soon as it comes up so it doesn't become technical debt. No, I think you're uh, pretty well explaining it, Phil. And mm -hmm. um, I know we've got students that are just getting into the industry, so they haven't experienced this yet, but I think it's really good information for them to see how this works. Uh, yeah. And I, I've tried to keep things reasonably generic. Um, and again, most of this should apply to almost any, any engineering position you end up in. Um, even if you're in product or anything like that, this can be very helpful. OK, so we've taken a look at the basic process, right? We know our different categories. We know how to calculate our maximum category uh, weight. We know how to calculate weights for a given item uh, based on how many different tech technical debt areas it's associated with. So now uh, we need a way to kind of weight these categories because no, uh, no operation inside of a business is equal. Uh, so infrastructure work could be way slower or way more complex uh, in its current state than say code work or feature definition. So to deal with this, uh, we will add waiting for complexity. Um, we're going to go back and look at this real quick. So our, our categories here, we can give an adjusted weight. So for this, oops, sorry, uh, for this, what we said is uh, code code dependencies and persistence debt. Uh, pardon me, um, is a times five weight adjustment. And this is just for an example. Um, this means that the code, do like to change code is almost five times more complex than say setting up a new sub, subnet, according to what we're seeing here, right? Again, this is just exa an example. 
Um, but our feature debt is also three times more uh, complex than, again, our infrastructure debt can be, right? Um, and this is how we weight uh, what can cost us more time just based on what we already know uh, about how our business functions or our team functions um, or how quickly we can resolve these different types of issues. Um, so with this, we can modify our weight cap calculation to take into account these different weights. Um, so again, we have a number of categories, um, but we're also going to take the total weight adjustments. Um, so in this case, uh, it's nine, right? Um, five, six, nine. Uh, and this gets pulled in uh, and divided by two uh, to keep the scaling within, uh, within a particular ratio. You don't need to worry about that, though. Um, and then we get our, our new technical debt weight cap that is now weighted. Uh, which we can see is 112.5. Uh, the number itself isn't necessarily important. Uh, it's just the fact that you know what the number is to compare uh, when you calculate like an individual technical debt task. So let's do, we're going to walk through one real quick with a weighted category. So we'll see here we have our, our normal trisection here. Um, and we're going to take a look at this again, but now our T, our TWA is different. Um, so with our new weighted categories, um, the weight of this task would now be 40.5 out of 112.5. Um, now, obviously, this is going to fluctuate depending on how much you weight certain items um, or anything like that. But this does scale to uh, arguably like an infinite amount of complexity because you can always just continue to add multiple categories to your category weights. Um, so it gives you a good scale. Um, you can go, you know, like do it in tens, ones, hundreds, however you want to do that's entirely up to you, really. Um, but this is how we would calculate a weighted technical debt um, to say that, you know, one type of technical debt often takes us like four times longer than others. You can account for that in your technical debt calculations. Okay, uh, that was, again, a lot of information. Um, uh, I tried to be pretty thorough, but uh, that's really the end of it. Um, that is really the entire process I use at GAP while managing the team uh, that I manage to address technical debt uh, in real time. Uh, and that would be my last point. This is for addressing technical debt like as it comes up. Uh, the reason this is nice is because once you have your maximum weight, and you know how to calculate the weight of a technical debt item, every time a technical debt item comes up, you can just punch in the number and you know the weight of that item and you can uh, assess whether you want to take that on or not. Unlike what happens in a lot of businesses where technical debt is reviewed on like a quarterly basis. So they, they let it build up for three, four months and then it's left to like guess, we have 50 tech debt items, I don't know, we think it's gonna take two months, right? Um, you can imagine that type of estimation doesn't often go well. Um, but if you can address it and analyze it when it comes up with something like this, it'll make it way easier to deal with uh, in the long run and keep your overall complexity and backlogs hopefully lower. Uh, questions? No, really good presentation, Phil. Um, so I'm curious what... Um, when and actually i wanted to say also that i knew of technical debt and i knew what it was uh, but i didn't realize they quantified it um like this with um a lot of companies i guess or some companies i think it's cool that they're able to quantify it um when does the technical debt weight become too much so you know is there a certain percentage or where you decide you can't do it because it's too much uh, yeah, absolutely. So there's, I mean, there's a couple, a couple avenues you can take for that. Um, one is your backlog is a good metric, right? So and this is more of like for an agile environment or anything, but it doesn't, even inside of a waterfall model or, or anything like that, you're still going to have like a ticket backlog. Um, I say one fourth of your backlog is the maximum you should have for technical debt items. 
everything else should be feature work, new additions, um, things like that. Uh, I find that to be a very strong indicator for the team is starting to drown in technical debt uh, or we're not being given time to address the technical debt. Uh, and once you hit like 50% of your backlog being technical debt, um, that means your code base is wildly more complex than it needs to be, right? If half of your to-do items are to go clean up your code, um, either, like that's a, that's a problem, or go clean up your infrastructure or something like that. So the backlog is a, a really good indicator for like how far along that tipping point is, you know, uh, what that is. Uh, the other metric is the average weight of your 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 dead items, right? So let's say you have a maximum weight of 100 um, and you started with an average technical com like debt complexity of 15. But over the last two months, your average has jumped to 36 uh, for complexity. That's you like that's something you should be looking at, right? Because why is your technical debt becoming more and more complicated to handle? Um, and that's indicative, at least in my own experience, of uh, code base problems or management issues with like infrastructure, uh, things like that, where complexity for management is is out of control. Um, so it's not happening, basically. Uh, those are the two big ones I look for. Yeah, no, good points. Definitely good points. Um, yeah, I can say my uh, brother works for Microsoft, and uh, he's been with them for about 11, 12 years. But he's kind of an old-time programmer, developer. He hates technical debt. Hates it. <laughs> uh, he, I think he want, most people do. Well, I mean, he he thinks that they should delay release longer to make sure everything's um, working better. Let's put it that way. I, I Don't get me wrong, I agree. That That is the correct answer, right? <laughs> like, yep. do, it right the, do it right the first time. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, it wouldn't be called a job if we got to do kind of everything we want, right? So you always have to temper that with, you know, ultimately you want to get paid, so you need to get the thing out for the business. So you know, we all get paid. Um, but I I agree. I'm a very strong advocate for uh, I don't honestly care if it's late to be really let me do it right the first way. Um, and that comes from a lot of different places for a lot of different people. For me, it's because uh, I'm on a pager duty rotation and I don't want to get woken up at three in the morning uh, because we left old code in a service. Right. No one wants that. I don't enjoy that. Um, so we all have different motivators, but it always comes down to. If the first implementation is incorrect, everything else is wrong. Yeah, and he's he's a senior developer, but he is uh, he's on call one weekend a month. Besides his full time job, uh, I, that sounds that sounds great uh, <laughs> for on call. That sounds that sounds wonderful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, and I'm curious, Phil, where are you located? Uh, so I'm in the Portland area. Um, okay. I just live in uh, Gresham, like one of the suburbs of the east. Gotcha. Uh, it's very hot. I, I turned my air conditioner off for this, and it's it's getting toasty. <laughs> you got the sweater on too. I understand. <laughs> uh, it's, it's short sleeve at, at least. Okay. Good. Good. All right. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to uh, raise your hand, and I'll unmute the mic. Um, you can put the question in the chat as well. Um, but it's uh, definitely a good presentation. I learned a lot. Um, like I said, I knew to, I knew of technical debt, but I didn't know how it was quantified. So that's really cool. Yeah, yeah there, and, there's a million uh, Phil, ways to do it. Is your LinkedIn a good place for people to connect with you on? I know that sometimes I probably forget to like ask questions during the talk, and then they come up later is uh, that a good place yes absolutely and in fact that is the only place you will find me i'm <laughs> i'm really not anywhere else uh, yeah, do you feel free to, to shoot me questions or anything like that looks like someone's asking can you show the weighted slide one more time oh yeah of course
Uh, or did they want uh, the category? Uh, the category weights. Okay, great. The other one. As well. Uh, it's a uh, really good breakdown with that slide of the uh, different categories. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. And again, you can add as many categories or remove as many categories as you want, uh, which is why I like using this is because I can form it to a team of two or I can form it to a team of 50. Um, and it will still be accurate for me. Also looks like Sam's got a question. Um, so for new developers, I can somewhat relate to this. Uh, there are technical debt elements of a job search that need to do that we need to do, like updating LinkedIn, GitHub, et cetera. But the balance is also critical. What things do you see new hires spend too much time with our own version of technical debt? What do potential new hires come in wasting time preparing for? And what do you wish they did more of? That's a, that's a really good question, actually. I like that. Um, I would say I, I think most people spend too much time trying to make a fancy GitHub. Um, I, I get applicants all the time that have immaculate GitHubs, um, which is, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with having an immaculate GitHub. But they spend time worried about how pretty the code looks, uh, but then when they get into the interview, they can't tell me what the code does. Um, so always focus more on knowing how to code rather than showing me that you can produce pretty code uh, type of thing. Um, and so like at Gap, uh, I'll use that as an example. We don't do like a super, super heavy uh, interview process, right? It's one call. Um, obviously, if it's for my team, you're going to interview with me. We'll get on a call, and we're just going to spend 45 minutes writing code together. That's the test. Um, we th Today, we have things like linters and tools to make things pretty. And to be honest, it can be ugly. But if it works really well, great. That's that's totally fine. We can, we can let it be ugly, right? Um, but that's the number one thing I see people spend a ton and ton of time on is trying to, to get these like Instagram levels of code repos. And it's just like, okay, calm down. It can be ugly, but you know, if it works super well, that's great. That's what we're after. Um, so that's what I would say. Okay. Uh, go do hacker rank okay. actually. Infinitely more, infinitely more valuable. Go do the, go do the exercises there. Uh, because that shows me the code that you wrote the first time, because you can only submit it once. Um, highly recommend. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions? I also put Phil's LinkedIn in there in case you guys come up with questions after the talk. Also, we're recording this um, tech talk and we're going to be posting it on our YouTube channel later today. Let me share a link with you guys where you can watch it. You can watch uh, this talk and all of our previous talks on there. And then also, um, we have another Tech Talk coming up next week. And uh, it's going to be Dr. Brent Wilson joining us again. Here is the talk. Check it out. Um, if there are no other questions, this is the end of the talk. Thank you so much, Phil, for giving us an awesome presentation. Uh, sorry for uh, the technical you, problems. No, it happens. It happens. Uh, we're going to make it Google Meets. So it's not on you. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Yeah, really good presentation, Phil. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we uh, did get it worked out. So it was uh, really good information for uh, attendees and our students. That was great. Yeah, thank you for having me. I enjoy doing these. Cool. All right, thanks everyone for coming out and uh, have a great weekend. Yep, have a great weekend, everyone, and see you next Friday.